serve at Regional Clanky. I'm from Otago University of Commerce. Um, I've been there since, I've been in Hokkaido since 99 and at the Tokyo Show Guy since 2003. And uh, I'm here today to talk to you about the Otago University of Commerce English Lecture Series. And uh, the connection to this conference is that in the, in the first sentence of, of Rudolph's uh, proposal by following on a linguist list, it said, uh, in the age of internationalization and globalization, it's important to use all means and media to bring quality research and innovative practices, not only to big urban centers, but also to smaller cities. And I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you why. Otara University of Commerce uh, is a bit remote, okay? It's, it's not very far from Sapporo City. Uh, Sapporo is 1.9 million people. But uh, it's about 40 kilometers west. It's on the coast. And on top of that, it's up the side of the mountain. That six months of the year is under snow. And by snow, I mean heavy snow. Cool. Okay. So uh, the first picture I have here is the, uh, the Chigo Misaka, OK? Hell's Slope. Yes. Uh, all right. Uh, it is uh, about two kilometers from the Tower Station. And it is uphill all the way. This is about three quarters of the way up the hill to the university. Okay, so what you're seeing is a 10 percent grade uh, for about the last 400 meters there. But this goes on much further, all the way down to the station, and eventually end up the, the port. Uh, it's a good 45 minute walk uphill from the train station. Uh, so it is a challenge. Uh, as you can see, it's a fairly rural neighborhood. There's really nothing behind the university except mountains. Um, Otaru itself has one of the highest uh, elderly populations in the country. It is seeing uh, a drain of uh, its talent going away, its children going away. Uh, and as a university, well, we're here. Okay. Uh, we have about 1,200 students uh, at our university. It's about the size of a, a high school. And one of the problems that I found, uh, and it's not only a problem of Otara University of Commerce, but it's a problem of many universities, is that uh, there's not a lot going on at the university when classes are not in session. Okay? At 5 o'clock at Otara Shodai, it is dead. And I mean, there's no one around. And I found that to be kind of disappointing. Um, I went through uh, the experience of being educated in, in college towns. And towns where, yes, there's nothing around except the university, so everything happened at the university. And uh, for example, uh, Southern Illinois University was where I did my undergrad before CAD. And it's basically cornfields surrounding a town of 25,000. And there are 25,000 additional students on the campus. So everything that took place at the university took place on campus. There were, there were talks, there were lectures, there were exhibitions, all kinds of things happening. We'll talk to you about it. You can hear the crickets chirp. Okay, it's that, that quiet. And that bothered me a lot. Okay, it really bothered me. Um, when I moved back over, I, I did my doctorate in Hawaii, and there was always something going on. I could hear a lecture every day if I wanted to. And I missed that experience. And I found myself um, driving home from work a lot, thinking, you know, I wish there was something to do tonight. Okay. There must be some, what are the students missing by not having the opportunity to experience these things? Uh, so I went back and started thinking about something I had done earlier when I was at Hokkaido at Hokkaido University. And I was there from 99 until 2003 when I moved over. Uh, I decided to try to start creating that experience again for my students. And by doing it through lectures, okay, because I knew there was a lot of talent available. And I wanted to bring that talent to my students and to the faculty and to everyone else. And I wanted to do it through English. Okay. Uh, we have a bit of an advantage at both Hokudai and Otaru Shodai. We're, we're considered the best universities on the island. So we get the, the, the best of the best. And we do have the super high schools feeding into our, our programs and stuff. So, so they come in with a, a little bit of a higher level. 
then come up and replace the salute of that to our, our advantage. And uh, this originally takes me back to uh, the year 2000 when I first started trying this at Polka Dot. And the problem I had at Polka Dot was it was a, a really entrenched system of faculty and students basically just going through the motions every day. And I found that really difficult to do. Okay. So I tried to start implementing the system uh, in order to give our students some opportunities to hear new ideas, to hear them through English, to ask questions, and to really put the English to use in some way. And the first four lectures I scheduled in 2000 failed miserably. We averaged about six people attending. And this was at a university of 18,000. Very large university, very centrally located, just blocks from the main train station. And it, it was mad. It was incredibly frustrating. Not only among the students not attending, but the faculty not attending. Okay, and if the faculty aren't supporting it and aren't pushing it to their students, then you're doomed uh, to fail. And uh, that's why I put that in there, uh, into the timeline that I added to the, uh, to the handout that you've probably seen. But after four lectures, we averaged six. Uh, it failed. I shelved it. I said, I'm not going to do this again. In 2003, I moved over to Otaru University of Commerce, a much smaller university, considered the second best university on the island, basically the business school of Okudai. And I suspect that's eventually what it will become. And uh, if the mergers with Ministry of Education go through, I think that's probably likely to happen. But I took it over there and I looked at it and I said, well, nothing's happening at night. We have a commuter campus where 70% of our students and faculty come from Stockholm and then go home when they're finished. Can this work? Okay, we're up on the side of the mountain. It's six months of the year we're under snow. Students could ski down the hill if they want to get back to the train station. Uh, fortunately, they don't because it's quite dangerous. But I decided in my I wouldn't call it good in my insanity. I decided to try this again. Okay. And the first speaker I brought in was, was a man named Joe Pali. He's, a, a, uh, he's an elderly man. He is a writer, uh, poet. And I brought him in and I went about publicizing it as best I could, saying, This is an experiment, that's Congress. Okay. And in the first season of 2010, which was fall of 2010, uh, I scheduled four lectures and I said, I'm going to try this again, just like I tried at Open Eye. If it fails, I'll show it again. And hopefully, in the future, we might be able to try this again. Uh, <clears throat> one of the conditions I set for this was that I believed if I'm going to do a lecture series, we should, we should pay our speakers. We really should pay our speakers. And I talked to the university, I found out that the guidelines were for the shop team to pay the, the uh, honorarium. We have set fees, which in itself presents its own problems because a lot of really talented speakers are accustomed to being paid more than national university pay scales will allow us to pay. So it takes a lot of creativity to really get talented speakers to come in. But I wasn't even thinking about that at the time. All I was thinking about was getting this thing started and taking advantage of the talent that we have available. And I can see, you know, coming here and listening to you guys speak today, I can see that there's talent here as well. Okay, and that um, in, in the Matsuyama area and probably throughout Chicago, there's a limitless amount of talent that you just have to track down and find. Okay, and I spent quite a bit of my time doing that, uh, of, of sitting on the internet, looking at people, trying to find out who is here, who's available, who's coming, and trying to set that down. So anyway, getting back to 2010, uh, I scheduled the first lecture. Uh, George Polly was the first speaker. Very nice man. It was like listening to a storyteller. Okay. And it set a really good first event for us because um, we had 15 in the audience for the first one. 
and we had a couple faculty members show up just to sort of see what was going on. And at a small university, word can get around pretty quick. Okay. So I thought, okay, we had a good start. Far better than anything I had in the Okay. So then I scheduled three other local ones. Um, there was a, a graduate student, a Polish graduate student, who was talking about her doctoral research. Uh, there was, uh, maybe you've heard of Arthur or maybe you David. Uh, all oh, all oh, oh, yeah, he came and spoke for us. Um, he's, he's a friend of mine. And uh, uh, then we had uh, a business objective. Because of the business focus of the university, I need to keep bringing in uh, business people as well. So that was our first attempt. Uh, we maintained the average, somewhere around 50. And uh, I videotaped them, and I had enough evidence to take to uh, not only the English department, but also to the president to say, look, I can do this. This is sustainable. Uh, what can you do to, to help? And in the second season, I started scheduling them. Um, and I got support from the university president, uh, who came up with uh, 400,000 in additional funding uh, to bring in speakers. And the average speaker, most of our, our speakers from outside from in Tokyo and stuff, it costs us around uh, 100,000, 110,000 to bring the speaker uh, like that. So we are a little bit careful about how we, we budget the money and stuff. But uh, I started originally on my own research budget. Uh, rather than me going to conferences, and bringing speakers in uh, to speak to get that going. Fortunately, now there's, I've been getting outside funding uh, to continue these things. But uh, then we went to a bigger slate uh, in 2011. Uh, spring of 2011, with 12 lectures in the series, we started bringing in more talented speakers, uh, not only local speakers, but speakers from part of the way. Again, we're trying to expand the series out and get it going. Um, you have to spend a lot of time talking to people to find out who's available, who's coming, to explain the series. Um, until recently, we didn't even we didn't have a website for it, so a lot of people didn't take me seriously. When I made the offer to them, I said, you know, we can do this for you, we can fly you up, we can uh, put you in a hotel for a night, pay you an honorary, and still some people didn't believe it. Sure. And uh, so now I'll, I'll show you a little bit later, I've got the data uh, for the website. But uh, we got a living treasure, Hawaii living treasure, pottery company, and that helped the series a lot. He worked with me at the University of Lines in Hawaii, and he came in and helped us. Uh, we're up to 15 speakers now in 16 weeks last semester, so a speaker a week. Okay? And starting with the class of 2011 freshmen, those were the first freshmen to come in. So it starts to become natural for them to attend these things. One of the problems we had was this was seen as something different. Okay? As far as I'm aware, this is the only one of its kind running in English in Japan right now at a university. And to get this to feel natural, we had to get the freshmen to start to see it as part of their experience as a student at the university. And we can start to see it happening now in 2012. Students who are no longer my students are still attending the lectures. The real website coming in are attending the lectures because there wasn't enough English courses available for them, English content courses available for them to take. So this is a supplement to that for them. Okay. Students wanting to study abroad see it as a test run for what they're going to experience when they go abroad. The faculty who are getting ready for professional conferences are attending them to look at the speaking strategies of the people who are coming in to see how they compare to them. So we have a number of things going on right now with this. Okay. And uh, make no mistake about it, this is not easy uh, to set up. This takes a lot of, a lot of time and a lot of energy. Okay. I spend uh, probably three or four hours a day just talking to speakers back and forth before I even get to the other stuff. Uh, and we'll work uh, mainly now because we're setting up a series for fall of this year. So, some of the things we've done, very slowly moving forward, inviting in the part-time faculty to present in the series as a way of including them in what we're doing in English department. Okay. 
extending it to the other faculties, so inviting the other faculties to come in and participate to see what we're doing, raising the visibility of the English department, and also making them feel like they're a part of this, so that they'll encourage their students to attend them as well. Okay. Uh, we had a joint lecture last semester with the law faculty, and we brought in a woman named Mis Misaki Kodama. She's now a PhD student uh, at Nagoya University. She worked for three years at Japan's mission to the United Nations in Geneva. That's a nice one to bring in. Um, and at each level, I'm trying to extend this, to open it up so it really is not only something that the English department sees it as its own, but something as the university rallies around. And at a small university, we can really do this. Okay. Now, as I said, we had 15 speakers last semester. I have 13 speakers on the schedule uh, for this semester. They're at the back of your handout, along with a full list of uh, previous speakers. So you can see what we've been doing. Uh, the types of speakers we come, who have been coming in. They're not only uh, English teachers, for example, or linguists. I've really been trying to make it as eclectic of a mix of interesting people as we can get. And the reason for doing that is because it exposes them to new topic areas. It exposes them to uh, a variety of speaking varieties, different dialects. And we've had, we've had speakers from Australia, uh, England, America, Northern Ireland, uh, just about all, Ghana, um, just about everything you can imagine in terms of variety. And not only varieties of English, but also varieties of topic, so that they're getting exposed to all of this different information. Okay. Now, we're not without problems. Okay. There's lots of problems. Okay. Being up on the side of a mountain in a small town with an aging population, very few young people, in a commuter school, in the middle of Hokkaido, in the middle of winter, makes it a challenge. <laughs> okay, I've just outlined just about every problem we face. Okay. But uh, there are other minor problems that we have as well. Problems with administrative issues. The least helpful people in terms of the, the lecture series are the office staff. Okay. The people handling the payments. Okay. They make it quite difficult. And let me, let me just uh, highlight an example, okay? Uh, we have an information sheet that has all the contact information, it has the bank account information and everything. The accounting office gets it, but if something is not right, if there's a problem, rather than looking and saying, okay, here's that person's cell number, let's call them, they send a message to the secretary of the English department, the secretary contacts me, I've got to contact them, rather than just doing it the correct. Okay, that is an immensely frustrating problem okay, that we haven't been able to overcome. Um, <clears throat> that is one of the problems. I mentioned the weather. Uh, six months of the year were under the snow. One of our lectures was canceled last year because a snowstorm hit on the day of the lecture and three people showed up for the lecture. Okay, it was unfortunate because the speaker was quite a good speaker. And I haven't been able to reschedule them since. We've only had one lecture canceled out of 39. Okay. So it's a bit of careful planning, it's a bit of advertising, it's a bit of encouraging colleagues to uh, encourage their students to attend. Now, me, uh, in some of my classes, I do require my students to attend at least three of the lectures okay. uh, as a means of doing that. I've tried to encourage other colleagues to do the same as a way of getting them. I did that with one particular class that was interesting because I required them to do it for three. I gave them a little slip that was like a like a points card, and I signed it every time they attended one of the lectures. I just had a box next to me as I was handling the lecture students, and a number of the students filled up the card. They knew what the rules were. They knew they only had to attend three. They attended eight. I was I was just shocked. You know, I didn't expect them to attend as many lectures as they could. But it was working, and it was showing that it was working, that students were taking an interest in what was going on. Okay. 
I'm hoping that as we continue doing this, it becomes much more natural. And everybody knows about it, everybody supports it. Okay. The location is a problem. We've started having some of the lectures at our satellite campus in Sapporo for particularly prominent speakers. Okay. This semester, in the beginning of November, we have the uh, professional basketball coach from the local franchise coming in to speak. He'll be speaking in Sapporo, and we'll open it up to the community and bring a large room for it. When uh, Saifi, the firstborn geisha, came uh, last year, we held it in Sapporo City uh, to allow for more people to attend, rather than having it out at the main campus. And we do that sometimes. Uh, publicity, advertising, always a challenge. Uh, national universities, of course, do not like to put their money into advertising. And that's a bit of a problem for us. It's starting to change. Does it pop? Yes. Do we advertise? Uh, it does if we advertise through the media. Mm -hmm. If we just advertise through our local websites and through our, our networks, then it doesn't cost anything. What would be the Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And uh, the effect. The effects. A number of students have said that it's helped them for preparing for studying abroad. Uh, others, it's made them more confident in asking questions. At Ontario University of Commerce, we, have a, we put a lot of pressure on the students about asking questions. Okay? We feel like it's a very important skill for them. It's an underdeveloped skill, particularly in the high schools. Even the super high schools are not really focusing on it as much as they should. So we put a big stress on that. So when the students come and they attend the lectures, we actually do get quite a few questions from the Japanese students, uh, even as, as low as the first years. So that's a uh, positive. Other professors are beginning to participate. The part-timers are becoming more involved, taking a more uh, a stronger interest in what we're doing, and that can only benefit uh, everybody as a whole. Right. Uh, some students are coming to school when there are no classes, simply coming for the lectures. We had a guitarist come in, a local guitarist, um, ragtime guitarist named Hamada Takashi. Uh, we held it outside on this beautiful embankment that we have at the university. It was incredible the number of students who showed up. Uh, we had well over 150 uh, coming just for that. And there were very few classes going on that day. So that it, it does work, it can work. But again, it's pushing and pushing and pushing until it starts to take it. It's a path, uh, right? Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll continue to uh, raise the quality of the lecture series, bring in more important speakers. Um, as we go, I'm hoping eventually to bring an ambassador up, and I'm hoping eventually to get a Nobel Prize winner to speak. Those are two goals I think are well within our reach. We have one right in Oka Guy, but he hasn't agreed to come over and speak yet. Okay, and that's Susan B. Sensei. So, Susan B. Sensei, if you see this video, I'm inviting you personally to come and speak in series. Okay. Um, <clears throat> What's the future hold? Well, the, the 2011 class is the first freshman class. And as I said, as we continue going through this, we'll continue to uh, make it more natural for them. It becomes part of the community of the university. Offshoots of this, um, we're hoping to bring more events to the university, okay? Uh, make it more uh, of a community on campus. Uh, we're talking about movie nights. We're talking about sponsored by different professors at the university, uh, choosing the movie for the night and adding things like that, um, exhibitions and things, shows at the university. Um, and hopefully that will uh, take effect. Uh, for those interested in starting a lecture series on your own, so now we have a couple minutes left, uh, logistics is the biggest difficulty. Okay? You need support from people. Okay? The university in the beginning did not support me on this. Okay? They didn't think it would work. So I didn't ask them if I could start the lecture series. Rule number one, do it, and then apologize for it later if it doesn't work. Don't ask for permission to do it, us. Because if you ask, they will say no. So just start it, and if anyone complains, apologize later. Okay? That's my advice to you. But it does start with speakers you know, if you're interested in doing it. Start with people around you, and start building it that way. And then start asking for applications. Um, 
I mentioned the Ontario University covers in winter. This is the beginning of winter. This is probably an October, November picture right here. Um, all of the tree line things you see here will be covered by January. Um, even this hill right here going up the campus gets quite scary in the car uh, on mid-January. You can go sliding down and there's students walking right here. Uh, the, from next week, hopefully this will be up. This is the beta for the New English uh, Lecture Series website uh, that we're doing. Uh, I'm doing. Uh, that's Tim Blankley. He's one of our part-time teachers. Um, one of the artists who came through. Uh, this is Thomas O. She lives in Thailand. Originally from Sapporo, beautiful painter. Um, this is one of our professors who's retiring this year, Kahuna Sensei. Um, but this series will go up. Uh, this website will go live next week. And uh, if you're interested in participating, it says bringing the world to Otaru one lecture at a time. Uh, this is where we're going with this. Okay. So there's an application down here where you can apply to speak in the series if you're interested. Um, a lot of it depends on funding. So far, I've been very fortunate uh, to get a lot of funding for this. And uh, I'm hopeful that we'll continue in the future. I'm also hoping to start uh, bringing in sponsorships for lectures as well. But so far, the university has been a bit reluctant on that because they want sponsorship money to go to the general fund. And I want it to go to the lecture series where go. it should go. So I'm trying to find a way to tinker the system to allow it uh, to occur. So what I'm thinking about doing is offering the sponsorships, but the sponsorship is paid by the company directly to the speaker that they want to host, rather than coming through the university. And then it, it works the way it is. And I just act as the, the location host for it. And that might be a way of circumventing that problem. But you're always looking for solutions to the little problems. That seems to be the, the pattern that I've experienced here. So right at 610, I will leave it there. I will thank you for your time, and I hope I will be able to welcome some of you to the lecture series in the future if you're interested in participating. And if you're interested in starting your own lecture series, um, I'd be happy to offer it any advice. Thank you. Any more things to go before you answer us a couple of questions? Happily. May I occupy the by the Yeah, right now we're averaging uh, still somewhere close to 50. It's about yeah. 46, 47 at the moment. And they, uh, you, you require them to come? No, I, I do for, if I if I have a particular class, yeah. uh, then I would require them to attend yeah. at, at the lower levels. Um, at the upper levels, they naturally sort of come to these things. So I don't really have to, to encourage them to want to do it. Um, Occasionally, some of the teachers will, ask, will say to me, can I bring a class? And I'll say, well, you know, just let me know ahead of time so I can make sure the room is big enough. Uh, regarding the student numbers, uh, we've had, with the, the one exception of the outlier, which was the, the day that we had the snowstorm, uh, we've had a low of about 10 and a high of about 150 for a lecture. And the guitarist I mentioned was about 100. It's hard to count because people are moving around outside rather than sitting still. And uh, but uh, when the consul general from the U.S. consulate came, we had 128. Uh, so there are probably four or five of those lectures where we've been over 100. And we have next week we have our first speaker from the U.S. Embassy coming in. The, mil the head of the military political section is coming in. So I'm expecting quite a good uh, showing, even though classes are not running right now. We're holding them in South Korea City. So I'm very fortunate. We've been building up the relationship with the, the consulate for that, and they're starting to send the speakers. So that's a top of the When you have these, these lectures, uh, you, you leave it up to the lecturer what they speak about, or for, for the most part, of, uh, uh, content information yeah. or for for the most part, um, I let people speak about what they're comfortable speaking about, uh -huh. and. Certain things don't be insightful, don't start a riot. And I, I basically made it clear with the university. I asked them three times: Is there are there any constraints on who I can invite? 
I mentioned police, political, military. Yeah. Military I had in my mind because of, we have such a large military presence in, in Hoka, in the Sapo area. And that was particular. Um, I mentioned religious figures. I read all these different things because I, I, I believe in intellectual curiosity. And whether I agree with someone's opinion or not, I'm willing to give them the platform to speak because I think it benefits our students. So as long as we don't cause a riot, we're pretty pretty safe. And I, I generally talk to speakers ahead of time, you know, get their topic, get an idea of what they're going to talk about, just in case there's going to be any, any problems. So far, no problems, no protesters, no. Um, I've been trying to encourage Sea Shepherd to come and the Japanese Whaling Commission to come to the university. And when that comes, I'll expect that they'll be coming on different days. <laughs> so that they don't overlap with each other. So. They, they all speak to you. Uh, they all speak in English. Uh, we, we have had one who got nervous uh, when she, uh, the artist that we saw there got nervous before her presentation that she switched into Japanese. But uh, basically because she was mostly painting and, and talking a little bit to us, it sort of worked out in the end. But uh, otherwise, everybody knows that what it's about. Sometimes the speakers will come to a presentation ahead of time to see what it's all about, and so if they're ready for their, their time. Other questions? Other questions? Uh, stud uh, ma ma uh, students have to uh, register at the lecture. No, see? It's, 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 open to the, it's open to the university community and, for the most part, to the public. Unless there's a particular reason to close it to the public, um, we don't close it, we leave it open. And we do get people coming up onto the campus, even the main campus, uh, from the community. That is good community relations for us because we are such a small university. Um, it's good for our university to have people come up and, and take a look. And then, from outside, uh, outside people, yeah, we do, we do actually uh, get quite a few outside people, depending on the topic and the speaker. Mm -hmm. um, our, those that we hold at the satellite campus in South World were right at the edge of Obudai's campus. Mm -hmm. So then we can get feeders off of Obudai coming uh, mm -hmm. to participate. And I've been trying to build the connections between the two universities anyway, so I kind of encourage, especially their Rubaxe Center uh, students, to come and participate in our series. And we're talking about a joint, a joint event together. Also talking about the joint, I'm going to meet next week with um, the guy who's running the Ted Sapporo lectures and see if we might be able to do a joint uh, event together to again a branch into the community longer. Well, now in my own university gym, we also have such a thing. I was studying at a small age and seeking out people who are people from outside. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping people will look at it as an opportunity to see and hear someone that they might not otherwise have the opportunity to, to be in contact with. And that's sort of what we're doing. But as you can see from the schedule that it is in the handout, uh, speakers come from a wide variety of areas. We have, we have a world famous tattoo artist coming in uh, this semester. Uh, interesting story, South Korean born and training uh, in the darker side of South Korea with the Yakuza tattoo artist is how he trained. Mm -hmm. And now he goes, he spends about 300 days a year on the road uh, as an invited tattoo artist at conventions all over the world. He's just coming back into South Korea at Christmas time, New Year's time for a break in his previous speaking series. Um, so my job is just as a facilitator for this, trying to get as much information as I can Who's going to be in town? When are they in town? Um, how do I get in contact with them? Are they available? If not this year, the next year. Okay. Um, the lecture series, this is going to go live next week. Um, the lecture series is going to get started. Uh, I get back on Monday. It starts on Wednesday. Um, and we'll run it through while classes are in turn. Uh, it'll run and then it shuts down in February, March, which are bad months for us anyway because the weather is really bad. And then April of next year, I'll be on sabbatical for six months, uh, writing the book, working on the book, working on the book. And so I'm going to shelve the series for six months, uh, simply because um, I 
haven't trained anyone else to do this yet, so I don't have any more mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a, it's a one man show with uh, some secretarial support. And then I'll bring it back again in fall of 2013. So right now I'm starting to collect the applications in fall of 2013. Uh, that's it. So there's one more thing. There's always, but it's one of those things I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep tight to my list. It's, it's, it's my baby. And uh, it's what I'm going to, it's what I hope to you know, build my legacy to show that I have. Probably one, of, one, one other important thing that you said is that uh, in the organized event, um, you have to start from the top, never ask, just get it going. Um, we had an event with the German uh, exchange service, and essentially it started with me asking telephonic directly to the president of the university here and the other university, and asking whether the president is in town. And they were both in town on a certain day. So that's what they said. Okay. They didn't say okay to the whole thing, but then I asked, I organized the event, and then they didn't say no. Because yeah. one of them says yes, the other one can't say no. Yeah. Although they wouldn't like any university uh, was really, they really had that problem. It, it really is one of the easiest ways to get things done here, is just go ahead and organize it. And then yeah. let the pieces top. fall into place. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much. Can you see part of the uh, series? Uh, are you going to stream that? Or? Uh, we have some of the videos that are up on YouTube. If I can just bring up YouTube real fast. Yeah. You're not going to stream it, right? Uh, yeah. No, we have we have streamed some of them on YouTube. No, I mean, uh, uh, not I, today. No. no. Uh, but some of them, depending on the room that we use, we have certain rooms that are, are more easily uh, uh, streamable. The videos are more streamable. Um, let me get into that. This is the channel. Yeah, we mask them all pretty nice. Good. I wear a bow tie that day. So. Mm -hmm. This was just one of the regular classrooms. We have we do have uh, auditoriums we use and things for bigger lectures, depending on how many people we anticipate coming to lectures. Yeah. But uh, well, Thomas Show and I, I, I run this channel as well. Um, probably three quarters of the lectures in the series are up there uh, right now. And as you can see.
can see the quality gets better as we get into 2012 and around high depth and things like that. But, um, Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I 